All right. Welcome to the ASP.NET Community Standup. I'm John Galloway. I'm a PM on the .NET Community team, and I'm happy to welcome back Taylor Southwick. And uh, we're going to be we're going to be talking about updating apps um, from framework to core using system web adapters and a bunch of other uh, tips and tricks and stuff you got, right? Yep, that's the idea. So Taylor, your your job, you work with this stuff all the time, right? You help customers migrate from existing. Some some call it legacy, others call it working <laughs> code. <laughs> right? Yep, yep. Yeah, most of my day job is spent meeting with customers, seeing where they're at, seeing what needs to be done to get them moving forward, wherever that needs to be, and uh, from, from wherever they happen to be. We understand okay. that customers may have followed what are best practices maybe 10, 15, 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Those best practices may change, but they haven't had time or resources to go update the code for that. And that can make it a challenge for migration. So one of the things I've been trying to do is figure out how we can help them from where they are, wherever that may be, to get to a more modern stack, be that .NET, uh, in this case, .NET Core. Cool, awesome. All right, well, as always, we'll start with our community links. Um, so those are, well, put those in the places I normally do. They're in the uh, show description. They are coming across in the comments and they are also right to, to, to here. All right, not a huge amount of them today. Let's see, I've got one that's going live while I'm talking, so let's see if it happens. Um, Starting off, we've got a post from Chet on debugging .NET containers with Visual Studio Code Docker tools. So it's cool. They've been adding a lot of stuff to the VS Code tooling for uh, .NET developers. So this is showing how um, when, you, um, when you create a, uh, a project, then um, when you use the new, new kind of publish, you use the publish uh, profile default container, then you are able to debug, and it shows here setting up your action debug start. And there's two ways of building. You can build directly with Docker. And so here, if you build using Docker, then you can do the Docker debugging container. And then the SDK also natively supports containers now. So if you build using uh, just directly using the .NET SDK, then you can debug directly in there too. Um, and then uh, publish and run, and you can attach to it. So cool stuff. The the um, containers folks have been doing a ton of great stuff. There's some really advanced posts um, from from Rich Lander. Um, a lot of great stuff going on there. So uh, so keep up with that. Okay, um, this is a great one here from uh, from Mark Heath. Mark does a ton of great stuff. Um, his uh, Side thing is his his uh, blog is titled Sound Code, and part of where I started reading about his stuff a long time ago is he writes some um, audio processing open source libraries for .NET that are pretty cool. Um, but so this one here, he's showing streaming from Azure Blob Storage with ASP.NET Core, and he's taking advantage of a few things. But uh, one of the big things is in uh, ASP.NET, he's directly streaming the results. So he's basically piping things through. You'll see here he's hooking up a blob client. And then some of the magic here is, so he hooks up the client here to get, uh, get access to the video. Um, and then for his streaming, this is the magic bit, I think, right here, that results.stream. Um, so there he's able to, you're basically like piping stuff through and it's, it's streaming through as you're watching. So, um, and then he also shows using that client, getting all the blobs and listing them out. And then he's using video.js on the front end to actually play from the stream. So it all kind of hooks together and, uh, you know, actually not a huge amount of code, really amazing to be able to do that. So, um, so anyhow that, yeah, like, like he's calling out there that results.stream is, is pretty slick to be able to do that. Uh, John Hilton actually has a blog series going. I'm highlighting this one, but um, he's going through uh, Blazor in .NET 8. We've got some upcoming shows where we'll go deeper into that as they're getting closer to the RCs. Um, but uh, so this one he's showing using uh, server-side rendering mode, um, showing using Razor or 
Blazor components in a page. And um, you know, with server-side rendering, then you're going to want to hook up interactivity to those two sometimes. Not necessarily, but if you do, there's different ways you can do that. So you can use the um, you can use the render mode server uh, to make it interactive. And then he also digs into showing using render mode client to show to do um, with WebAssembly as well. So again, this this is a series. I'm just calling out this specific one, um, but he's got some other some other good ones in there as well. All right. Jesse Liberty got a series going on creating APIs in .NET. So I love Jesse's constantly learning stuff. I've worked with Jesse for a long time. Um, when I first started at, at Microsoft over 10 years ago, he was a teammate. And uh, so I love how he's constantly learning new things. Um, so here he's just digging into creating APIs in .NET and talking about how um, you know this is kind of a, hey, if you know .NET generally, but you're not up to date on the new API stuff, Let's let's go through it. So um, so this is the first in the series, and he just is going through them. All right, Khalid Abu uh talking about the .NET 8 time provider and unit tests. So this is really cool. In the past, mocking time-based things in .NET has been, and unit testing time-based things in .NET has been difficult. Say you've got uh, an application that behaves differently at nights compared to days or on weekends or you know has a feature that's going to turn on after a certain time or something like that um, that's that's been difficult to test so now there's a time provider and that does a few things one it makes it easier to test and then two is apparently inside of the um the dotnet source code there were multiple kind of implementations of this um, a lot of different people had to solve the same problem. And so there were different people solving it the same way over and over again. So here there's one time provider, and um, then you can hook up your tests, um, tests to this time provider. You can directly use them. And then here he's showing uh, using a fake time provider. You can say, okay, now the time is this, and your code continues to work the same. So here's his unit test using that fake time provider. Um, so yeah, cool stuff. All right, let's see if this, la this last one was down before the thing. Oh, yeah, it's live. OK. So we're announcing uh, .NET Conf. Um, so this is um, you know anyone that's been around .NET for a while. This is every November. We announce uh, .NET in November, and we have a conference to kick it off. So this is our blog post talking about that. Um, so you can, uh, you can go in and save the date. That's November 14th through 16th. Uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff. One of the big things right now is now is your time to submit your live sessions. I'm part of the um, team that's going to be picking the um, community presentations. Uh, last year, we weren't able to feature as many as we wanted. I think this year, we're actually going to be able to feature more community presentations. Um, but there is a um, time period where uh, you got to get them submitted, and now it's the time. So here's some of the themes we're going to be talking about. Um, we've got, And then we've got our worldwide local events as well. So that is my spiel. And I will actually, this one, um, I'm going to throw this one specifically in the chat because I want people to read that and submit your awesome um, sessions. All right. So Taylor, it's, I'll turn it over to you. So um, where should we go? Do you want to start with your slides right away? Yeah, let's go ahead and start with that. <clears throat> All right. So. Yeah, so today I thought I'd start a little bit with some of like the, the patterns that we recommend around incremental migration. Uh, I've seen, I saw some comments in the, that have already been posted about like Upgrade Assistant. That is a great tool to, um, that helps with some of the aspects of this. The, the main challenges that I'll be talking about here are more the patterns and some of the practices that we've seen around it, not necessarily the tooling around it. There's other documentation and videos you can watch on that. Uh, but this is more about just like the general, how do you even approach this? And um, one of the comments I saw was that you could just run an upgrade system and go. If that works for you, do it. That is, if, if that works, no need to do this incremental approach. But what we've seen is with larger, uh, larger code bases, it becomes difficult to just do this in a, um, a one-time thing. 
that it becomes something that they need to be able to make changes incrementally. And so one of the largest challenges we've seen with this ends up being around usage of system.web, specifically system.web.http context in libraries that may be multiple layers deep in the stack. Mm. And it becomes difficult to be able to migrate that while still being able to provide value to their business. And so between the two of these are usually the reason we see people doing an incremental approach. And this, this doesn't necessarily mean that if you have um, a small number of projects, that then you're fine, you can do it just in one go. Um, feel free to give that a try. But we've seen even small projects that maybe have a lot of dependencies or a lot of complex logic be something that this process can help with. So let me give an overview of what these adapters are. Last time I was on here, we were still in the process of developing them and we've come a long way since then. So the main supported scenarios and the, the biggest one that we, um, the goal of this project was to enable shared library support for some of the system.web types. System.web itself has a whole bunch of stuff in the one reference. So we're not supporting the entire thing. That unfortunately does not, that, that means that it is, does not support things like web forms. It is not intended to support like the, like the membership system that web forms provides or system web provided. This is more about some of the, the, the types, the interchange types that may have been used. And it's, we do that in a .NET standard compliant way. So you can compile your libraries against .NET standard, and then they will work on framework or core. And I'll get into the details of how that works in a little bit. We also support strongly typed session values. One of the differences you note as you go from framework to core is that what the, the HTTP context.session becomes goes from being a key object, a string object key pair system to being a string byte array, which you can totally handle that yourself if you want, but it becomes difficult if you scale it out to a lot of usages of this. And so we provide mechanisms to continue using that string object session session uh, object type. We also provide some scenarios to support shared authentication with the existing app. So this way you can add a new application and start use and continue using your framework authentication with your new ASP.NET Core application as you start getting that on um, rolled out in your environment. And new with um, with version 1.2 that we released a few weeks ago is IHTP module integration. This is not the IAS IHTP module. It's more of an emulation layer. So if you have HTTP modules that you can't figure out how to rewrite, we have support now so that you can integrate that into an ASP.NET Core pipeline. I will give a huge caveat that the, in the general case, I don't recommend migrating in this way. Uh, most HTTP module implementations I've seen can easily be migrated to uh, to just middleware. However, I've also seen some that are thousands of lines long that hook into a lot of events, and it makes it so that becomes a blocker to migrate. So those are the scenarios that this is intended to help. It, as with most of the stuff with system web adapters, it's intended to help on those extreme cases where you've got a lot of complexity that you can't easily decompose into an ASP.NET ASP Core-ism. So here are some of the adapters that we provide in system.web. And uh, the most common one is HTTP context. There's also HTTP context.current. This is one that a lot of people relied on. Um, there's ways around, around accessing this in core, of course, but we provide just the HTTP context.current. And this is system.web.htp context.current. There's also the response, the request, session state, cookies, and a lot more. And this continually grows. Uh, we're on GitHub, and we've been having contributions from various people of new APIs that they find that they need that we did not include in the initial pass. So some of the features of this is that it supports implicit conversion between HTTP contexts between ASP.NET Core and System.Web. What this means is if you have a method that needs an HTTP context, a system.web.http context, you can just pass into it the ASP.NET Core, and it will convert it for you behind the scenes. 
And it does this in a performant way. It caches it. You only get one instance of the system.web.http context per request. But it allows you to switch between the two. And this will play into later as you try to migrate away from this. The, the library supports targeting .NET Framework, .NET 6 Plus, and .NET Standard. Uh, and there, there's a few different packages that I'll get into. But as long as you're targeting .NET Standard 2.0, it works. I did notice some comments around .NET 3.5. Unfortunately, the library on Framework currently only supports, uh, I believe it's 4.5 and above. If 4.0 or 3.5 is an important target for you, for whatever reason, please feel free to file an issue on GitHub. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of this is that it gives you that .NET standard implementation, which will unify to Framework when you are running on Framework. So you compile against our new library but if you're running on framework, it just type forwards it to system.web.dll and you get the exact same behavior. So this is just a layer that facilitates us being able to inject stuff on the core side, but we don't do much on the framework side at all. Another key design of this is that it's pass-through design. So for the most part, if you do one do something on the core side or on the framework side of the APIs, so if you're using the ASP.NET Core HTTP context or the system.web HTTP context, uh, it will be mirrored in the other. Uh, it We try to keep this pass-through design to facilitate that kind of thing, which then helps when you're migrating off of the adapters and onto more of the ASP.NET Core isms. And finally, it requires very minimal code changes, especially in your libraries. Your libraries, it's essentially just a replacement of your referencing system.web. You may change it to the, the system web adapters. On the ASP.NET Core side, there's a minimal setup you can do that you can configure how some of the things work. And I'll show some examples of that in a little bit. So if you can go back to that for a second, but one one important thing for people that are newer here may have missed that. Like this is great because it allows for um, side-by-side up upgrades, right? So yes. all the things you're showing there, like with the standard and type forwarding, um, you can write code that is gonna work, continue to work with your framework application right. and will work with your core modern code. So, because yep. I think, you know, like, and we've we've covered this more in depth um, in past shows, but a lot of what's great here with, with this system is this incremental side-by-side -side upgrade. So you can, mm -hmm. you don't have to do a whole rewrite where your code is unavailable for a while or whatever, right? Correct, yep. Yeah. And that's actually, after this screen is exactly is what I'll get into that. Okay. And probably I'll... the fact that you're bringing it up, I think it probably should have been first, but <laughs> we'll get into that, like more of the pattern of what we're, what we recommend um, yeah. instead of, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a sec. But yes, that is exactly the value of it. As I said at the beginning, if you're able just to migrate everything over to .NET Core and you didn't take reliance on system.web stuff, more power to you, go that way. That is by far, the ideal situation. But we also know that that ideal situation is not common in larger, older code bases. Yeah. So there are four packages that um, that are available. It uh, looks like the forming is a little off here. But the first one is the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.System Web Adapters. This is, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> uh, but these are intended for libraries. There's no dependencies on it. And it is targets .NET Standard 2 Plus, as well as .NET Framework 4.5. And um, I think those are the main targets of it, because that, that's what really matters there. But there's no dependencies for that. And that was a key design decision here, so that when you add it to one of your lower libraries, you're not adding any sort of dependencies on ASP.NET Core itself. Uh, it's it's purely just um, an adapter library with no, like no real implementation there. The next one is this abstractions library. This is important um, as shared services for core and framework for integration with ASP.NET. For the most part, you probably don't need to touch this. But if you want to implement any shared like serialization of session states, this is the package you'd use for that. And then there's an individual package for ASP.NET Core and one for ASP.NET Framework, aptly named Core Services and Framework Services. And th this allows for integration. And so this is the core services is what you'll add to your core app. Framework services is what you'll add to the framework app. So as John was mentioning, 
this this plays a role in how we recommend migrating .asp.NET framework apps from framework to core. And it's an implementation of the Stringler fake pattern. This is a common pattern for migrations. And this what we're talking about here is an implementation of it. We have seen various forms of this. This is one that we've tried to consolidate so that it's a simple pattern that you can start with, and then you can adapt it for what works best for your applications. But it, it's intended for that incremental process so that you can continue adding value to your business. And the unit of work of what you're going to be migrating here is a route. And this is implemented in different ways depending on the framework you're coming from. This could be a web API endpoint, a controller, a page and web forms, a HTTP handler, or any other concept that would fall under a route. And what you translate that to on the core side, there's, there's not always a one-to-one -one mapping. And sometimes there's no great choice, as many of you probably have seen for pages for web forms. There's no direct mapping. Like Blazor can work there, but sometimes people just do Razor pages. There's, there's a lot of options there. But the idea is that you work with a route and you incrementally migrate that over. Can, can you, um, just question, can you clarify, what do you mean by unit of work there? Yeah, a unit of work is, what, what are you going to do for like a user story? When you're defining your, the, like when you're defining the work you're going to put into a sprint, you're okay. going to want to look at a route, migrating a route over at a time. And that's something that the, this pattern should help you be able to take that into a user story that you can complete end to end and get a route moved from framework to core within a sprint. That's the, that's kind of the idea of the unit of work here. When your boss says, what are you working on? You say, I'm migrating over the order page or exactly. I'm, I'm moving over the API control, whatever. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. And as part of the implementation of this Strangler fig pattern, we recommend using Yarp to proxy the request from core to framework. So this is all, this is still somewhat abstract. So here's kind of how we diagram it out where you're starting off when you have just your legacy ASP.NET framework application with you have your external traffic and you're going to your ASP.NET application and then you have your business logic. The recommendation we have now is to add this core application in front of your ASP.NET application. And you have ASP.NET core use Yarp to proxy back any requests that it can't handle to ASP.NET. Initially, it's just gonna be proxying everything back. And this is, we recommend that people do this. We've, we've worked with a number of customers who have been applying this pattern. And this step is actually one of the trickier ones from an organizational standpoint, mostly because it requires buy-off from like ops and deployment and more people than just the engineers. Because you're adding a new application in a reverse proxy. There's some complexity there from the operations deployment side of things. But once you have this set up, then you're able to start um, using the adapters to connect to your business logic in the ASP.NET Core application, and you can start moving routes over from ASP.NET Framework to ASP.NET Core while um, continuing to have this in your production environment. Over time, your ASP.NET Core application will have more of the routes, and you'll have your serve on almost all of it, and maybe just a few things will be left in the Framework application. And then hopefully at some point, you can get rid of the framework application because all you need is that core application. Well, you know, one one thing that you pass through there, but the, you, when you start with your business logic is going to be in your web or some of it may be in your web forms app, right? Right, and, that is that, true. Yes. That's part of the work is abstracting it. Now, once you've got, yep. but that's what this allows you to do. Once you've got that Yarp proxy, then you can start saying like, hey, this is a service. We can move this over. Here's, you know, an order yep. processor. Let's move that. Yeah, and that's a good point. That a lot of logic in the in these older applications are just in the web forms page, like on the page load, on the event handlers, mm -hmm. things like that. So part part of what needs to be done is creating a, a a class or some some utility that can be used that is independent of the UI level layer there that does the business logic. It can still use a lot of the system web stuff, like mm -hmm. grabbing headers, setting response aspects. Can still do a lot of that, but it needs to be moved to its own class so that it can then be referenced 
independently by the core application. And then, although like we put a lot of work into these adapters, we do hope at some point you don't need them. And so the idea is that you can remove that and all you've got is your core application and you're using pure ASP.NET Core. So at a high level, that's kind of the pattern that we're hoping people can do here. Yep. Uh, we understand that this is very hand wavy. And when I've worked with customers, some of them have been working for a few years on this pattern and it is a long process for these larger applications that still need to be deployed to production, still need to be serviced. And so it's it, part of the goal of this process is that it can be something you can just work on sometimes when you have just have spare time, but it's something that you can get set up so that you can start making progress on that conversion. That's a really key point that you're showing there is that, and like you're saying, you're working with customers that are migrating over a period of years. And I think sometimes when I'll talk to people They'll say, we've got this big thing. We just can't seem to like, sometime we're going to have to migrate it, but it's going to be a big deal and we can't do it right now. And, you know, like here, we can't shut down for three months or whatever. Right. And so, um, yeah. but I think what's great about this pattern is that you can get started and you can even just start creating new, we're creating a new API. We'll create the new API in core, you know, just start right. creating the new stuff in the new app and kind of over time migrate. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a lot of different approaches there, depending on how much they want to deal with the technical debt of relying on these ASP.NET framework types and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, yeah, they just, it, it's used as a process to do the rewrite uh, and come up with a better, maybe rest API endpoint for it. But yeah. There's a lot of approaches there, but the general yeah. idea is that we're trying to push with this is how to incrementally do it so you can justify to your business groups that you're not that you're still going to be able to provide value while taking care of this technical debt to get onto core, uh, but not have it keep pushed down the line. Okay. I'm trying not to interrupt you too much. There's some great questions coming in. I want to take two and feel free for both of these to say I'll get to them later. Okay. So one is just saying, like, what about web forms? And I, I we've talked about this a little bit. Like, this is a common scenario. Do it you is. want to get to that later, or do you want to mention it now, or what do you think? So one of the demos I'm going to show is how you how you can uh, incrementally migrate a, a, a web forms page to Blazor. Okay. It's not necessarily a one to one. It's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but it is an option. Um, okay. Web forms, there is like it's no there's no straightforward way of doing it. We've seen a lot of different ways that people have approached it, and we're not we're not really sure of what is like the best one to recommend because everyone did web forms in different way that it's not like a straightforward just do this, and yeah. it's it's always going to be some work unfortunately. Okay, and you kind of answered the other question here, but what about Blazor? Like, what is the Blazor support or whatever in there? Um, I'm not sure what that question means. Um, there are some workarounds you have to do to be able to have Blazor in this with uh, with a Yarp. And that's something I will be getting to as well. It was something that showed up a lot. Um, at a high level, the issue is that both Blazor and Yarp uh, register, registered themselves as fallback routes. Mm. And so it became kind of uh, who, who got it first thing of, um, and so I, there's a workaround for it, but that is going to be fixed in uh, .NET 8. There's a better story there as well that it will be inbox. Cool. And so, um, but I'll get I'll get to how you work around that for .NET 6 and 7. Okay. So before we get into some demos, I just wanted to go through some of the strategies to remove the adapters. And this is maybe something more just to keep in mind as you're going through it, because uh, it's something that you can push off till later. But um, one of the first things we hear people wanting to do is move authentication to ASP.NET Core. Uh, we don't have a great story on how to handle that yet, if you want to have this incremental migration. There's an open issue on GitHub. Please thumbs up it if it's something that you um, really want to see done. Um, but some things that you can do yourself in order to move off the adapters is come up, use your own abstraction for sessions. Uh, we, we provide that ability to have like a strongly typed session. Come up with your own abstraction for that so you can own that and then you can manage how that hand that that works isolate out your system.web usage and see what you can do to like move stuff into pocos and get it away from system.web types and this goes for asp.net core types as well we don't recommend using 
the HTTPNet core HTTP context in low-level libraries either. You should adapt that into your own um, types at some at some level. Um, and keep in mind, not everything is a one-to-one -one mapping. That's why we have the adapters, because we tried just doing API replacements, but it didn't work. And so if you want, if you ever want to understand how we adapt them, feel free to look at the source code, see if there's something you can do in your stuff that could maybe facilitate your specific use case. And then I'll I'll get I'll show an example of how you can migrate usage per method if needed. Uh, so that way you can slowly move off of the adapters as well. So at this point, if there's no other questions we want to um, go into, I've got a few demos I wanted to walk through. Uh, there are some other questions, but I have a feeling you're going to be answering some of them. So why don't we go into that? And... Okay, sounds good. So what I'll be doing for the demo here is I'm going to be going through the samples that we have available on GitHub in the um, in the system web adapters repo. And so you're able to clone that and you can play around with it yourself. So what I want to start with first is what it looks like to register things on the ASP.NET core side of things. So here, here's a program.cs with a web application builder. And it's a relatively simple way of registering things. You add a system web adapters off of the services. And then from there, you can add the things you care about. Right now, what we're doing is we're wrapping the ASP.NET Core session. So this means that the session back by the system.web.httpcontext.session is actually going to be the same as the ASP.NET Core session. But we're going to be opinionated on how we do the serialization of the session, which you can see here of uh, we're adding the session serializer. And I'll get into how you can customize that. That's been a common question. Um, and uh, we can customize that however we want. There's a lot of additional things that you can add here that I'll get into some of it, but play around with it. We've got some documentation out there of some of the things you can, you can control and um, customize yourself. The other key aspect of the system web adapters on the core side is that we have a bunch of middleware that we need to inject. And so after, sometime after routing, you want to add use system web adapters. If you're wrapping the session, you need to add that beforehand so that it's available for the system web adapters. But some of the things the middleware will do is things like HTTP context dot request in system dot web would pre buffer the input stream if you did dot input stream. Uh, it doesn't do that on framework. I mean on core, and so the the middleware middleware handles that. Uh, it also also handles um, a number of other aspects of the core infrastructure that needs to be um, that we, we need to hook in into different ways to enable some of the system down web behavior. However, we've worked hard so that that behavior is still generally opt in that you only get it if you're doing it off of the types of system dot web. So if you have this use a system web adapter as middleware, but you're not using it using the stuff anywhere, you should you should not be incurring any of the cost of this adapter layer. So one of the things I wanted to highlight with the system web adapters here is a session. It's a common question we've had with, with people of how to, how to customize some of the session serialization. And so I've got a demo here that, again, you can access on the, um, on the GitHub page. But what it does is it shows how you can register with the built-in JSON session serializer a way to have an integer that's call count and a nullable integer of item. And these types are, you can do whatever you want now. Something that we fixed in 1.2 was that nullable stuff didn't work. And something else that we added in 1.2 of the system of adapters is that you can register as many of these custom I session key serializers as you want. And we will just go through them until we find a serializer that can handle the session key that is, um, that, that is being requested. Before this, in order to customize it, you had to implement a lot more stuff. So as part of this demo, what we've done is we've implemented a byte array serializer that pretty much just con converts um, a byte array to a byte array. Just, it doesn't do anything special except keeps it as a byte array um, if the session key is array. 
And the way that this works, if we scroll down to the byte array serializer, is that there are two methods on it. Try deserialize and try serialize. And for each of them, you get passed in the key. And then depending if you're deserializing or serializing, you get the bytes or the, the value. And so you can you can do this however you want. We've seen people who need to be able to do this on um, like dynamic, dynamically generated keys. Well, you can now do that more easily. Uh, you can also use this to potentially track what are the unknown session key serializers to be able to, I mean, the session keys so that you can then go like fill that in. So let me run this application and we can kind of walk through what it's doing. And I guess a key point of this process is that you don't have to stay with IIS. It can be done on any, any, uh, any web server you want. Okay, we'll do IIS Express here. Um, but you can do it on anything. And uh, okay, that's not working either. Let me try here. Oh no. Yeah, restart Visual Studio, see if that helps. Um, but we do see when people migrate that they will often go to a, um, they'll, they'll stay with a similar setup for their uh, deployments. And so they will end up with um, uh, IS deployments and they'll be deploying to the same IS instance. And this way they can maintain a lot of the deployment stuff that they're aware of. Failing now. <laughs> oh, maybe it's okay. There we go. Okay, it is working. There we go. Okay, so let's see what the what the endpoints are we have. So what we're going to do is take a look at the first one of count, and this is just going to be tracking in that session how many times it's hit. It's a relatively simple endpoint, but it allows you to just count how many times people are hitting this endpoint. If we go to our custom serialization, we'll see that it will add in a custom value. It's auto-generated, and it stores it. If we put a breakpoint on this custom serializer, you'll be able to see what happens as you're trying to do it. So and the so, web page is really tiny. I think it's just some random oh, text, right? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. I forgot to make that bigger. Yes, it is just random text. Okay. Uh, it's just generating a byte array and then storing that in the in the session. The, cool. the whole the whole point here is just to show that how easy it can be to customize some of the session state. Okay. Uh, this was a common ask as after uh, we first released it, but you're able to um, easily hook in now and. Mm -hmm customize some of that. So so here you're passing that back and forth between like it's it's coming from the core application it's able to to read and write that against the like it's going through the system web adapter. It's going through the system web adapters, but right now we haven't yet added a framework backend. We're just okay. on core. So this is only using ASP.NET core okay. types. And so this is kind of highlighting that you can continue using the adapters without any framework backend. Uh, it's something you that it's it just enables these APIs. How you okay. hook that up is different. Um, on the last time I was on the call, and as well as a couple of things on MS Learn, I have videos on how to set up the session with uh, with the remote access. But one thing I've seen when talking with customers is because we focus so much on the that incremental with the framework up in the background, they didn't realize you don't need that. It can uh, run locally as well. So yeah. I just wanted to highlight that aspect here okay. so that you know that like you don't have to keep that framework app around once you don't need any routes there. Okay. But we're going to hop into a, a demo that will show that framework backend because it doesn't really make sense without that. And what we're going to look at is remote auth. And this is something where, um, as you're migrating, 
authentication can be a difficult thing to migrate. So to ease that out of the box, we provide ways so that you can use your backend framework app as a as the source of truth for your identity. Uh, this is not authorization in any way. It's just the ident identity author authentication aspect. So but, where is where is the login happening on this? Like, is that handled by the? Good question. Okay. Let, let me <laughs> dive into that because this is something that is a little bit tricky to set up, but once you do, then then it will work. So let's go to the app startup. The auth. So on the framework side, this is being done with Owen and being using their way of doing it. The similar setup can be done depending on other options. And we have other examples for common ways of doing this. But this is the one that is a little bit more complicated. And I wanted to highlight how to do it here. So this is using um, the identity platform on ASP.NET framework. And um, it's it, it's an, it's a representative of an existing app that's been around for a while. So okay. what you have to do to enable to share this with ASP.NET Core is first you have to use you have to get a shared data protection layer, and this is how you set it up with Owen. There's some documentation online on different ways of doing it depending on the framework you're using, but the important part is that you get a shared set of keys. So if you're deploying into the same IES instance, you can have a shared path that you're using. If it's somewhere else, you'll have to share those keys in some way. But on framework, it allows you to set it up to, uh, to share the data protection layer here. Yep. And then the rest of it is pretty much the same. If you want to explicitly set the cookie name, I believe this is the default one, but if you want to explicitly set the cookie name, it may be helpful just so you don't uh, get confused on why why you're setting it in ASP.NET Core but not ASP.NET Framework, because mm -hmm. the cookie name has the cookie has to be the same. So between yeah. getting the cookie and the data protection the same, then we're set to be able to enable some remote auth. So so what you're setting up both the front end, both the framework and the core app both need to be able to read your authentication cookie, right? Yes. And exactly. so the two things you need for that, one is the cookie name needs to be the same. And then two yep. is there's decryption keys to be able to decrypt the key to be able to read the authentication information. And so you're making sure the, the shared keys are set up. Yep. Well, th this is more, this is actually more used for the, uh, for the decrypting the cookie. So you can read the cookie. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if we hop over to the core app, you'll see that we have a similar setup. And the O1 setup is similar but different to the uh, the core setup. Uh, we don't currently have a package that will just set this up for you because they each bring in different packages and there's no common thing there. Uh, but it's, it's maybe like, as you see, six lines of code or something. Uh, and depending on how you're deploying it, this Having the the keys may be uh, something you'll have to you'll have to figure out how to set up on your system if you're deploying into different systems. Yeah. There's also uh, this remote app client configuration we have on the core side. Yeah. So if you recall back to where we had that core app calls into the framework app for proxying, we also have the ability to set up the a client server relationship between the framework and core app so that you can query some information from that remote app. And so this allows you to configure where is that framework app and what is the, there's a, we have, we require an API key to be able to have a secure communication there. And we highly recommend doing this over HTTPS. Uh, I, I can't remember if we enforce that. We may, we may actually enforce that. Okay, so the deal here is you want the core app to be able to directly call into the framework app there and the system web, web adapter sets up an API for that and this is configuring the security to allow that and, and telling it where to find that. Correct, yep. Okay. And the last bit of configuration that you were just talking about is that the system web adapter needs to expose an endpoint. Okay. And it does that by if you 
some of these are for different things. Let me get rid of that for now. Um, the remote app server is what is needed here. The, the session serializer stuff here so that you can share that session, which I'm not going to highlight in this example today. Uh, this right. is more focused on the remote app author uh, authentication. But this authentication server is the part that you want to add here. Okay. And we have documentation on what this endpoint is. And we we highly recommend that as you migrate, uh, as you try this setup, that you have the core app be the only public endpoint for this. Mm -hmm. So that everything to the framework app gets funneled through the proxy and your framework app can become hidden from the public network. Okay. Uh, if, if you don't do it that way, um, you'll, you'll probably want to, like, you want to be aware that we are exposing an endpoint here. It is locked down by an API key. And I believe we checked for uh, that it's a secure connection, but just be aware that it does expose that. Okay, so like just talking this through, making sure I, I'm keeping up. I've got a framework store. I've got a, a, whole, a whole store running on .NET Framework. And now I want to change maybe just the checkout part, the final part of the, the checkout. My, I'm storing, I'm browsing through the store. I'm putting a bunch of stuff in my shopping cart. I'm storing that in session because that's what yep. I do. And then I go to checkout. And now I'm over in the core app. And my core app needs to be able to read that shopping cart. And yep. so it's doing that through an API provided by system web adapters configured yep. here. It's got an endpoint and an API key. And it says, hey, framework app, give me the, give me the um, stuff that's in session state. Give right. me, and, and, then, and then the framework app says, sure, here you go. Here's the shopping cart. And then my core app that I've migrated over, now that processes the order. Yep. Yep. OK, exactly. cool. Yep. So. I'll run this quickly. All right. Everything worked right before I got on, and now I'm getting different issues. <laughs> no, that's fine. This is real so, world, right? I don't think I'll be able <laughs> to actually run right. this. <laughs> yep. Um, so feel free, those on the call, uh, like those watching here, like go to the system web adapters, and you can grab this and run it. I'm not sure why that's failing all of a sudden. Um, I'm going to hop, I'm going to skip, uh, move on to a different demo that I know people have asked some questions around that yeah. I wanted to show around web forms. And so now, let me also, I, I believe too, um, this is part of, there's the 18 part video series that yes. Mike Russo did and he shows this as well. So I can include that. Yes. Link. Yep. And he shows a lot of these things that we've touched on, but mm -hmm. we're not really diving into on this one. Because his is it's like five hour series. It's five hour series, but it's it's all in like bite sized chunks. So you can just go yeah, and find the really find good. the part that you care about. Cool. Yep. So, oh, okay. It's set up as. Maybe, let me set the startup again. So, if those not familiar with this menu when doing this migration, uh, setting up the can the startup projects where you can start multiple startup projects. Is really helpful so you can get them both going whenever you need. So what I want to highlight here is a way to migrate Blazor apps, uh, Web Forms apps to Blazor. So one of the challenges with Web Forms apps is that there is no like one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, mm -hmm. For any of those who have tried doing it, like I mean, we we have some recommendations around going to Blazor. Uh, I mean, I, I even helped write some ebook on this and. Like at the time, we thought like this is this is going to be helpful, but the more we've seen people do this, it, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, mm -hmm. and it also is one of those like big bang approaches. Like if you have a big page, trying to migrate all of that is really tricky. So yeah. the thing I want to highlight here is how you can migrate Blaze uh, Web Forms apps to Blazor in a bottom-up approach on like a per-control basis. Uh, so this uses a a Blazor concept that was released with .NET 7, I believe, called Custom Elements. Most of the documentation and the, the demos I've seen around this are about incorporating Blazor into React apps. But mm -hmm. the same idea can be used to incorporate it into Web Forms app. And so you can register a custom element. And I have a simple Blazor app that just says, hello world from ASP.NET Core, and tells you the route that it's at. And it will 
uh, allow you now to in in any HTML, including web forms, you can put a hello world tag with whatever uh, the parameters are, and it will then set things up to serve Blazor. Right, right, okay. Yeah, nice. so I'm going to hop over to the master page, and over here you can see a few changes I had to do in order to get it to work. So one of them is... Maybe I didn't put it in the master page. Oh, yeah, here it is in the master page. Mm -hmm. I put the Blazor server JavaScript. Just add that in there. This, yep. this way, it will be able to hook things up. Other than that, you see that there is this hello world that it's just of normal HTML. It doesn't uh, have like any, it's not web forms. It's just mm -hmm. HTML here. But this is what the custom elements will detect. And, and insert into the DOM there the Blazor content. I'm going to pass into it the path just so we can kind of see where we're at. And this will show up on every one of the pages. So, so I'll go ahead really and cool. So that's relying on HTML's just custom element support, modern HTML. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, somehow my uh, uh, the setup for my global.json got all mixed up. So let me, I really want to be able to show this demo. So I'm going to see if yeah. I can find one Very of the supported, <laughs> one of the ones <laughs> I actually have on the path there. I'll try and look while this is coming in. Yeah. Um, yeah, see good, if there's any uh, comments we want to make sure we address. Yeah, there's some good discussion here. Um, let me see. People talking. You know what? One thing here, I just wanted to call this one out. I'll talk to it while while you're doing that debugging. But this, um, you know, somebody saying, "Hey, I guess I'll rewrite it one day. I'm going to push it along." There's, you know, some bad code and stuff. Yeah. Honestly, I recommend get started now. You can start using the upgrade assistant. You can plug it. You can put in that front end proxy, and you can start over time mm -hmm. with your updates. You know. Like instead of putting it off for like this big bang rewrite. Exactly. Yeah. Like the whole goal of this is allowing a way to do it slowly. Mm -hmm. Like maybe one sprint, you just go through and upgrade assistant will now replace your system.web references with the the uh or the system.web references with the system web adapters. Mm -hmm. And that way you can at least make sure that you're not referencing anything from system.web that we don't support in the system web adapters. Um, but looking at figuring out how, how you can approach it slowly so that way it doesn't become this thing that all of a sudden you want to do, but you've kind yeah. of made progress on it. Yeah. But also look at what's the lifespan of the app. .NET Framework is going to be supported. Like It's not like it's go that support is going away. So if it's something yeah. you don't really need, you can stay where you are. Yep. But this is for people who want to move and are having struggling to get that that momentum going. So I see you got it going and I see Yeah, I got, got it going. Through. And nice. here's that. And you see that this is a web forms app, but this is a the Blazor component. And if we open up the debugger, let's uh look at the ne network. We'll see that. There we go. That one of these will show us some indication that it's using web for uh, uh, ASP.NET uh, ASP Blazor. There we go. It's oh, nice. Okay. Getting the WebSocket component. And this is where some of the stuff coming in .NET 8, I think, will help move, yeah. move forward some of the migration for web forms to Blazor. Because with .NET 8, Blazor is getting more support for uh, having the server-side rendering that WebForms had, and so mm -hmm. like that's something that as that as that becomes like more solid, I'm hoping we'll be able to figure out how to incorporate that into some of the recommendations here. So, so, so I did want to. Oh, well, just ahead. kind of talking through as you're showing that. So. What's neat with that now, you've shown a Blazor page running in, in core, all the newest stuff. And then I'm able to, in that, now I could use system web adapters to get session state or get other things from 
to get values from the, the .NET Framework app. So let's say I've got a report page and this is a component of that report page. I could, incre I could incrementally update parts of my dashboard or whatever, rewrite individual components from, from web forms to Blazor, for instance. Yeah. And then when I'm eventually, I've say I've got 12 different little components in my dashboard. Once I finish the 12th one, I've changed the, the shell that's hosting those components and I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I did. I wanted to point out one other thing to get Blazor to work because there were some comments earlier about Blazor support. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, as I mentioned, is Blazor by default, the, the template that's generated will just register fallback, meaning that anything that is not handled is sent to Blazor. And this is done so that deep linking will work for Blazor. Mm -hmm. But that's also how the reverse proxy works. And yeah. so um, there's there's a set of extension methods that we have on the documentation that for this pa these patterns of what you can put into your project to enable Blazor support. It's not something we're putting into the box because the whole process of how Blazor endpoints are registered is changing for .NET 8. So this is more of something you need to do if you want to be able to do Blazor in .NET 6 or 7. It should work out of the box much more easily with .NET 8. But there's a set of uh, extension methods, and we'll link. I'm not sure John had the best way to link here, but um, the, there's some documentation for ASP.NET incremental migration that there's, there's this example. You can also find it here on the samples project we have. But yeah. what it essentially does is it finds all of your components, it registers them, so they're explicitly registered rather than fallback. OK. I'm sharing a link to a, a post that I helped pull together that has the, the video series and it has a bunch of links. Um, if you want to give me any specific links, you can share in StreamYard over on the right. Um, there's a little chat that you can send them to me. Um, or um, or you can just tell me. I can go into GitHub and pop open yeah. the page. Here it is. I don't have chat hooked up on here though. Okay. It's no it's AS, it's learn.microsoft.com slash ASP.NET slash core slash migration. Okay. Um so I know we're I think we're at time. I've got a couple more demos, but I can just point people to where to go for them. So it's up to you if you want a couple if you want to take another five, ten minutes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, let me just show a couple more things that people tend to ask about while using this more okay. like the operational side of things. Mm -hmm. With um, one of the questions we got very quickly was, how do you turn off one of these migrated endpoints in the sense of an A-B test? Say you've deployed something to your ASP.NET application, uh, ASP.NET Core application, but you find there's something wrong with it and you want to fall back to your legacy application without having to redeploy anything. Mm -hmm. And like every time I brought this up with a customer without having an answer to that, it was like the first question they asked. Yeah. So we have an answer for that. And it's, again, a set of um, extension methods you can add to your own project to control it. Um, if we go back to the, re the remote um, uh, identity, the remote authentication, what, what we do is we recommend now that there is, uh, where is it? Well, I'll go here. So what we recommend is hooking into the, the, the actual endpoint selection. And I have a, an example of how you can do this in a way that's abstract, where you can implement an interface that you have in your project after you copy this in, that what it will do is hook into the actual endpoint selection and allow you to run some custom code to be able to turn things on or off. And at that point, you'd have access to all the metadata for a uh, for an endpoint. And so common ways I've seen people do this is like, oh, I want to be able to just turn off the, this area of migrated, like for MVC. Um, or other people want to be able just to turn it off uh, with like a feature flag of like, oh, like we're not happy with this for whatever reason, just be able to turn it off. So with this um, endpoint selection that you can hook into and the the, in, the incremental migration documentation has all of this spelled out for you. You can do something like this, where this is an example one that's probably not what you'd actually want to do, but it makes it easy to demo, mm -hmm. where 
you can add a query value of ignore local. And if you set that to true, it will bypass any of the local endpoints that you've added this conditional concept to. And it will allow you to just skip skip it and it goes back to the framework app. So at runtime, you can turn it on or off uh, however you want for your application. Like if you have feature flags set up in a certain way, mm -hmm. if you want like to do certain like cookies or environments or whatever, you can you can control that from here. Cool. You can set an environment variable or well, yeah. Yeah, or or if it's something that you have like from the the hosting environment, like on yeah. development, you you want to enable it on development, maybe. Okay. Uh, you can have it so that it you you can implement this iConditional endpoint selector to only work on development. Cool. And so okay. it's it's very flexible in how you do it. Uh, it's currently just like kind of a sample you can copy into your project because we don't know the best place to go because it's not really it's not really just a migration thing. Like it's something that seems like it would be useful for. Anytime you're enabling an endpoint that you kind of want to be able to turn off if you want. Yeah. And huh. so one last thing about it is that it is set up so that it's done with uh and with metadata, the same way that like MVC attributes or metadata that a route has. With minimal with minimal APIs, there's metadata that you can add to an endpoint. And so you only incur the cost of this route selection if you've enabled it for it. So uh, we've added the sample code has this with conditional route. Oh, you, nice. If you add that, that's when those routes that like the controllers now have that ability. But if you have, I don't know, like your own another set of APIs that you don't really care about turning on or off, it doesn't incur any runtime cost then because it's not it's not applicable there. Got and it. So it's again going with the theme that we don't want to add cost like performance penalties for some of these behaviors if you're not going to be using them. It's a pay-for-play kind of idea. Uh, but it allows you to conditionally run a route if you care about it. Okay. Cool. The last demo uh, is one of the things that we added in 1.2 is modules. And this is one of those things that, as I said at the beginning, that ideally you don't need this. But if you want to be able to migrate a custom module that is has a lot of like intense mm -hmm. uh, or like custom behavior that you just can't tease apart, yeah. Uh, it, this is this is a way forward. So for those of you not familiar with what what, what I'm referring to, it's an IHTTP module that allowed you to hook into all of these different requests yeah. events that occurred during the ASP.NET Framework pipeline. This was tied to IAS. These are IAS events. And on ASP.NET Framework, they would invoke these events at the time IAS was invoking them. In a way, it's kind of like what you use middleware for now. Exactly. Right? We recommend you use middleware for this. But this I, is... I do remember in the day writing a decent amount of, of modules. I felt really slick and then also like, it was also easy to get myself in some pretty bad trouble with them. <laughs> it was, especially because like th there's all these different events and yeah. trying to make sure that you're hooking into the right one and doing things the right way. It's, it's, it's a different yeah. pattern. And we, yeah. we, what we're providing is an emulation layer for it. And so it's kind of a best effort attempt at it, but because it's such a different pattern that we don't, we don't yet have a feel for how well it's going to work with like crazy big uh, modules. Mm -hmm. We have been testing it out with two modules that one is 10,000 lines, the other is 20,000 lines, and each of them hook into like seven or so events that it's, okay. everything's interleaved. And wow. that, that development team seems happy with this implementation of it. But the way that it works is it provides support for HTTP application that if Google.asax had a HTTP application with events that you can hook into, and then mm -hmm. on, onto that, it would um, add these modules and invoke the events. So it, you configure it with adding an HTTP module, um, HTTP application, and you register modules like this. The custom HTTP applications can have the same kind of events that you may have done with uh, HTTP.NET Framework, and it would be invoked in a similar way. 
This does potentially allow you to copy your global.asax over or share that if you want. Wow. Uh, we haven't seen anyone do that yet, but it's potential, I guess. Huh. Um, uh, one of the APIs exposed from HTTP application people would use is get varied by custom string. And this mm -hmm. allowed you to customize any sort of output caching. The, the way that you can hook this up in ASP.NET Core is with output caching, which only works on .NET 7 and above. It's a new feature in .NET 7. So this, this method here, the add HTTP application base policy, is only available there. But what it does is it allows you to give some keys that will be queried by your custom, um, vary by custom string method and hooks into all of the output caching. Okay. So this is a new thing with 1.2. Uh, if you have need of module support, it's there. Um, but again, it's more of a give it a try if you need it or if you like a, as part of a migration, but try to get onto middleware as quickly as possible. Okay. The, everything is just handled in the middleware, and so it invokes the type the um, the uh, the events as you'd expect. The it also allows you to capture errors that occur in the module events and allows you to handle them appropriately, clear them out, uh, and so you can you can migrate more code more easily with this. But it's stuff that, if possible, try not to use it just because it does add overhead. Yeah. And it's 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 not an insubstantial amount of overhead that once you register an application, an HTTP application, what it, in order to have behavior consistent with framework, we have to keep a pool of HTTP application instances available and each of them have their own module collection attached to them. Wow. And so because in ASP.NET framework world, yeah. Uh, yeah, people would it. store state in the modules, the HTTP applications. It was something that per request, it was expected that you had full control of that. So there is a pool of these things that gets created and you can control it as well as additional middleware that gets injected. So if you don't need it, don't use it. But if you okay. need it, it's there. Well, so what I'm picking up from this and, and you've gone into some more in-depth scenarios, I think to try and summarize some of this up, don't be scared if you're showing some more advanced like if you've got if you if you're really like struggling migrating some advanced parts of an application over yes. you've got all this stuff in system web adapters what i've seen in migrating some relatively small but not completely trivial apps is i use migration assistant most of my stuff came over pretty smoothly you know yep. and then yep. but it's nice to have these kind of escape hatches of like oh no i'm using a bunch of system web stuff you can still incrementally migrate that over. Yeah, yeah. And that that's, let me reiterate what you're saying as well. I totally agree with that. That is, as I've said a few times in this uh, live stream, that the, the things I'm showing are generally for the more complicated, difficult to migrate apps. And we want to provide help for those. If you're able to just use Upgrade Assistant and have it work, great. But if it gets complicated where you need that incremental approach, you need that some of these more advanced things like uh, being able to have modules or uh, incrementally move some of the web page controls into Blazor, th this is for you then. But it is one of those things that like, it, we hope it's a point in time thing. But yeah. we also understand that it can take a long time for large applications, but if you're able to do it quickly and just like get it done, again, more power to you. That is ideal. And you, so, and like, just to make sure it's clear, you've worked with large real world customers that are doing exactly this. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the main driver of this project was collaboration with companies that are, have hundreds, if not thousands of projects in their application. And how do you migrate in that? Um, but I've also seen this come into play with, where it's only maybe like tens of projects where it's just complicated enough. No one's touched some of the code for a long time or yeah. uh, there's just hesitancy. One of the values of this process is not even necessarily some of this complexity I showed you. It's more just that getting confident with having some of the stuff in core and have, feeling like you have a fallback. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're able to migrate everything over in one 
I would suggest trying to do do it in a way that allows you to continue to um, test it in in production with this ASP.NET Core setup. Okay. Um, looks like your video is frozen for me. I'm not sure if it has for everybody. Yeah, something just happened. I'm not sure. But okay. I think we're near the end, so... We're basically um, at time. I did want to take a couple of questions real quick, but okay. Well, one is reporting services. Do you have a recommendation for reporting services? Um, reporting services. Can the I mean, I guess exactly you could just keep it. To. Yeah, I mean, is so, this like some of the S was like SRSS or something like yeah reporting? The general recommendation at this point is moving to Power BI. Yeah, but that's a whole different conversation of migration, unfortunately. Cool. All right. I think we're at a pretty good place to wrap. I did want to share just one thing real quick. Here you mentioned the, um, this is the docs you recommended, I think, the incremental ASP.NET to core my update. So I, I shared that yep. before. And then one thing I shared also in the chat is just, this is a blog post. This has my face on it, but it's me showing off a bunch of other people's work, basically. So this, this by the way, your video is back, which is nice. <laughs> so, um, but for instance, this talks about how you can find out about the upgrade. This shows about a two hour um, uh, overview that we did. And then um, there's also a learn module. And then here's this deep dive video series thing that I talked about. This is um, Mike Russo's walkthrough. Some of these things in a lot more depth. I mean, they're, they're bite sized, but that's five hours of stuff. So this is if you're serious about learning about this, covers a lot of scenarios, including like um, WCF and auth and session state and a lot of stuff there. So just wanted to make sure to show that stuff. Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah. Somehow, you, uh, I think I can take you off mute. Nope. It says your mic's not connected. I think we're at an awesome spot to wrap up. This was amazing. Thanks a bunch, Taylor. Um, and thanks for the great questions. And um, I'm sure we'll have you back on as you continue to build more cool stuff. So thanks, everybody. All right.